Um, when I give this presentation, I want you guys to realize that this is in the context of the entire Lake Superior Basin, not so much in the context of tributaries or smaller lakes. Um, and I say that because when we look at Lake Superior, what fish are doing and what's being loaded are not connected. Um, in fact, emissions are declining in the U.S. There's publications on that. Uh, the deposition to Lake Superior from the atmosphere is declining, and concentrations in Lake Superior are declining. Okay? This is the same for Lake Michigan, this is the same for Lake Huron. Previously, I measured a ton of trout in Lake, in Lake um, Michigan, and this was the fish response. Okay? So just generally, we're looking at concentration. Following about the 1970s, we saw a nice decline because of all the positive things we were doing in the, in the lakes to improve them. And then in 1990, we saw a really quick jump. And I'm telling you, this is not an emissions issue. This is a food web issue. And so when we think about concentrations of contaminants generally, we have to think beyond what we measure as a, as a concentration itself and start to consider where the fish is eating and what's depositing. So for instance, when we look at Lake Superior, we might expect something like this because there hasn't been this huge change to the ecosystem from dressing the mussels. There's been a ton of other responses, but we haven't measured those yet. So the, the increase here in Michigan is entirely due to dietary shifts from invasive mussels. And so what we use to confirm that from a food web standpoint is carbon nitrogen isotopes. When we look at mercury sources, we actually see a different story. We see that there was a large shift in mercury sources in the late 1980s because we stopped burning mercury in our municipal waste and from battery use. And we see now that mercury sources are continuing to even closer reflect what's considered maybe a global signal. Okay, so regional emission changes benefited the Great Lakes almost immediately. Okay, and so we'll try to confirm that with Lake Superior, but we haven't begun that work yet. But it's only through the combined use of mercury stable isotopes, carbon stable isotopes, and nitrogen stable isotopes were we able to do that. So another question might be, why haven't Lake Superior trout responded more rapidly? Okay, and this is a very complex system. Often when we consider bioaccumulation, it's more, it's, it's more fundamentally important at the lower food web. Okay, that's the area where we want to target for these very hyper-efficient um, bioaccumulation molecules. Um, in oligotrophic systems like this. So why are the responses different and, or what, what might we expect to be different between Lake Superior and Lake Michigan? When we look at a source portfolio to Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, we see that they're fairly similar with the, with the exception that there's a little more of maybe an industry which is a yellow or watershed type influence in Michigan than proportionally more atmospheric signal type in Lake Superior. What's another difference? The prey difference are vastly um, thank you. are vastly different between the two lakes, but we haven't characterized any of that from the isotope standpoint in the mercury world. And then what are we actually collecting when we collect lake trout? Um, so I work with the Great Lakes Fish Mining and Surveillance Program trout, and predominantly those are lean trout. Are those lean trouts from hatcheries or are they wildlings? And that's going to change over this 40 year period. Okay. So I, I leave you with this because I want to return all the way back to the lower food web part of this because I think that's going to be where we get the best bang for a buck and that's how it relates to CSMI. I, I hypothesize that the, 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 the dominant source of mercury to lake trout in the offshore regions is from microbial methylation of mercury in the open water column. Then, where do those plankton get their mercury? Well, if it is from the benthos, we can measure that. That'll be isotopically dissimilar. If it's from runoff, we can measure that and that'll be isotopically dissimilar from a mercury standpoint. And likewise, if it's from the pelagic zone, that'll be isotopically similar. So, we can do something like this and get a proportion of each mercury source to the fish once we have those end member measurements, but we don't have those. So with CSMI, we either need to collect a lot of plankton, which will require improvements in collection, collection techniques, whether that's tucker trawls or something else, or we're gonna need a very diverse array of prey fish that kind of covers these various gills so that I can make these measurements. So I leave you with this, with our need, and I leave you with what the potential outcome is. Outcome is.